always really difficult, and I'm asked this question often, to attribute uh, a particular motivation to someone's actions. Tonight, a man is arrested and charged after he drove into people at the Winnipeg Freedom Convoy. Back then, they're the ones that used to keep the peace and, and find ways to deal with with any violence or any anything that's not right. Also, why using Dene values will help stop family violence. It represents uh, when we're taken and brought back by a full plane. And a Kraken's tentacles hold a float plane, a tribute to another artist's work, this time in snow. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. The trucker's occupation of downtown Ottawa is trying the patience of local residents and business owners. The city has declared a state of emergency and at least one conservative senator is leaving the party. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. Dennis Patterson says he's had enough. The fact that some of his conservative colleagues openly support the anti-vaccine demonstrators was more than he could take. Last Friday, he formally resigned from the Conservative Caucus. And what really drove me to lose confidence in my leadership in the Parliamentary Caucus was the failure, frankly, to uh, condemn this um, Freedom Convoy and actually statements and actions which appeared to condone it. And that's not the party I belong to um, most of my adult life. Other senators are registering their unhappiness with the occupation too. Nine Indigenous senators released a statement over the weekend saying in part, we strongly support everyone's right to protest in a peaceful manner. However, we cannot stand with or for intolerance, hate or violence of any kind. Patterson agrees. I've heard from parents in Nunavut who've sent their children to Ottawa and are very much, very scared for their safety and security, asking me to uh, take a take a stand and try to work to to uh, towards a a more a safer environment. On Monday, the NDP also held a press conference. Jagmeet Singh says the Prime Minister needs to take a stronger stand against the occupation. I think I think that term, they're allowed to flourish, has been accurate. And I think people are really angry by that and really frustrated by that, that uh, this flagrant um, ignoring of the laws, breaking of the laws, fragrantly breaking laws uh, has been allowed to happen. Singh is calling for Trudeau to immediately meet with municipal leaders and find out what they need to end the occupation as quickly and peacefully as possible. Patterson will now sit as a member of the Canadian Senators group. Fraser Needham, APTA National News, Ottawa. If you live on Baffin Island, you get pretty familiar with Ottawa. The nation's capital is a travel and medical hub for the eastern part of Nunavut. That means when protesters began rolling, began rolling into Ottawa last week, Nunavumiat were there to see and hear it too. Our Kent Driscoll caught up with one of those travelers, one with lots of protest experience herself. This from Akaluit. This is what Ottawa has looked and sounded like for 11 days now, as anti-vaccine mandate protesters have clogged the downtown core. Last week, there were 96 Nunavut residents in Ottawa for medical travel. Many medical tests and procedures are done in Ottawa for Baffin Island residents. Many of those travelers stay downtown. Well. Lisi no, Papazzi was one of those travelers and, and saw the protesters we firsthand. They were staying in her hotel. We were maybe right from the actual street, maybe 10, 15 minute walk down. Um, the honking at night was really loud. Um, they were, and they had fireworks at nighttime. Papazzi is no stranger to protest. She was one of the founders of Feeding My Family, a group that protests and draws awareness to Nunavut's high cost of living. Still, the protest was a stretch for the experienced advocate. She says the protesters staying at her hotel were polite. Some of the ones on the street heckled her face mask. I have to say the actual people at the hotel, the people, people were really nice. Like, um, if they 
asked us if we need help with something or they tried to help us. The actual, I think these were the good protesters. They must have been because they were really, really nice. Uh, they weren't like uh, mean or like being rude to us whatsoever in the hotel. Outside the hotel, it was a different story, but one that Papazzi was anticipating. Uh, when we were walking, one day a, a truck passed by and they uh, take a mask off, you need to breathe, something like that. So they were telling us to take our mask off. Um, in the hotel, in the actual hotel, I didn't, we didn't experience that and I think we were very lucky. Tunga Suvingat Inuit provides services for Ottawa's large Inuit population. They've asked the protesters to go home as they're impeding service to the more vulnerable clients. Many of the protesters have a lot in common. Their anti-vaccine mandate, and they're loud about it. Another thing in common, the vast majority are white. Papasi says 99% of the protesters she saw were white. It's really, it was really intimidating. Um, I mean, the good thing is I was lucky because I have my husband who's white. <laughs> like just him being white was the protector. Like I knew I'd be okay because I'm walking with a white guy. Almost a hundred Nunavut residents had to put up with this noise last week. This week, there'll be more Nunavut mute who need the help of a doctor and are going to have to travel to Ottawa to get it. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News. Account. Meanwhile, things took a violent turn at the Freedom Convoy in Winnipeg on the weekend. An Indigenous man from Headingley, Manitoba has been charged with 11 offences after four protesters with the truckers' convoy at the legislature in Winnipeg were hit by a jeep last week. Winnipeg police have charged 42-year-old David Zakarik with assault with a weapon and dangerous driving causing harm, as well as failing to stop at an accident. He was arrested after speeding away from the scene and running red lights, according to police. Zagarek is a Cree Sioux punk musician. When he was taken into custody, police say he made comments that suggest his motivation, quote, wasn't specifically about the vaccine mandates. What I can tell you here is that some comments were made by the accused that sense, tends to suggest that this was not specifically about the mandates. I don't have a lot more information, but I, I think that might be important for the media and the public to understand. Now, whether or not we can we can sort of rely on those comments uh, is another question. And, and the individual was uh, was taken into custody with some resistance, so this was not someone who was compliant. Um, and the comments were blurted out. But as I I will repeat, it it looks like the um, actions were not uh, really as a result of the mandates. In southern Alberta, tragedy on the Siksika Nation. Three members there died in a house fire on Saturday. In a release, RCMP and the nation confirmed the fire broke out in the early morning of February 5th. The identities of the victims have not been released and the cause of the fire is under investigation. Siksika leadership stated it is asking for privacy for the family at this time and have no additional information. The RCMP in Manitoba are reporting the second death this year at the Stony Mountain Penitentiary outside Winnipeg, the 10th since January of 2021. RCMP say earlier today, a 36-year-old male succumbed to injuries he suffered during an assault on January 1st of this year. Police are treating the death as a homicide. The name of the victim has not been released and no charges have been laid. Last month, the Southern Chiefs organization called for a thorough investigation into the death of a, of a Pine Creek First Nation man at the prison. All right, we need to take a short break, but still to come. Advocates in BC say people who need shelters can't keep being left out in the cold. It's very hard to see that when it's, it's freezing out and there's people sleeping outside and they're filling doorways.
welcome back. A Simshian man had multiple toes amputated after sleeping on the streets of northern BC in extreme cold. Ira Shaw alleges that in late December, he was kicked out of a BC housing funded shelter in Prince Rupert, which led to frostbite. Advocates say people who need shelters can't keep being left out in the cold. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. Stephanie Angus is Niska, but has lived in Prince Rupert for over 10 years. She says she's on social assistance, but can't afford a place in the city. Angus alleges she was kicked out of emergency homeless shelter this winter. Well, every time I speak up in there, I get kicked out. The last time I got kicked out for two weeks, I found out two days later they threw all my stuff away in garbage. Why I'm being back. Erica Carlson and Dana Mastre are advocates in Prince Rupert. They want to raise awareness about people sleeping on the streets while there is a low barrier cold weather shelter open. It's very hard to see that when it's it's freezing out and there's people sleeping outside and they're filling doorways. So it's just hard to see and somebody needs to speak up and and maybe make the public aware for a change. Two years ago, they raise concerns for the safety of homeless with a campaign at City Hall. They say nothing has changed. I have a couple tents about the treatment of the homeless and about them getting kicked out into this cold weather. There were so many on the streets and we don't understand why when we have a shelter. So, and not a thing has changed. According to BC Housing, they found Cranes Crossing homeless shelter for 35 beds in Prince Rupert. Due to physical distancing rules, there are 28 available. They say it operated at near capacity. We reached out to the shelter operator, North Coast Transition Society, for a comment. They did not comment. Instead, they sent an email statement from BC Housing, which stated they can't comment on specific incidents due to privacy. We contacted BC Housing, and they stated, During the extreme cold weather in early January, the temporary shelter at Fisherman's Hall was made available to anyone staying outside including people who were previously asked not to return to the shelter for breaching policies. If a shelter guest repeatedly demonstrates unsafe behavior, they'll be asked to leave for the safety of others in the shelter. Ira Shaw is MCN, living in Prince Rupert without a home for nearly three years. Shaw alleges Cranes Cross and Cold Weather Shelter kicked him out for making contact with the worker's hand while they were trying to take his soup. I guess they were trying to clear the tables and I just tapped one of the worker's hands and. They told me I had to leave for an hour and went back an hour. They told me they said I'm out for two weeks. Shaw is unsure of exact dates, but knows it was around his birthday, December 26. That week, Environment Canada issued an advisory. Frostbite and hypothermia could occur in minutes. The North Coast had an Arctic outflow warnings of wind chills of minus 20 and minus 30. Shaw went to sleep on the streets of Prince Rupert in extremely dangerous conditions. My toes. I kind of figured they were getting crossed, but I didn't know really. And my fingers. There's a couple of sleeping bags and winter boots on too. Days later, Shaw's family advocated for him to be allowed back in the shelter. Crane's Crossing allowed Shaw to return. He laid in bed for two days, immobile. Shaw says early in January, the shelter paid for a taxi to the hospital. Shaw had multiple visits for treatment on his feet. In mid-January, when the frostbite damage didn't heal, he needed surgery. Doctors removed damaged parts of his toes on each of his feet. Then, late in January, he was transported to a hospital in Terrace, BC. Four toes were removed. Ira Shaw remains in Prince Rupert Hospital Healing. Stephanie Anga says homeless may have addictions, but they deserve better treatment. Start treating us like we're human beings. That we have feelings, that we matter. Advocates say they are working with Shaw to find housing. They are concerned he will struggle to walk. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Prince Rupert. A friendship center in the Northwest Territories is looking to incorporate Dene values and beliefs to address family violence. And as APTN's Charlotte Moore Jacobs explains, the work needs to begin through supporting elders. Here's that story. I've been through it myself, right? A lot of abusive relationship. Terry Naskin has been working to end family violence since the 1970s. A respected elder and knowledge holder from Bechacon, Northwest Territories, today she's at the Klintjo Friendship Centre 
providing feedback on how community members can address intimate partner violence. And the other obstacle we see is like some people are married 20 years, eh? 25 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't just charge them, throw them in jail because that family, they have this. The community. NWT has some of the highest rates of police reported family violence in the country, a rate 10 times the national average, according to Statistics Canada. And there's no women's shelter in the Clinton region. The services can be very lengthy. If something really drastic happened, you want to leave like tomorrow. It's not going to happen with a lot of um, uh, the process of getting all everything done, and it, it's very difficult. Our people are strong. That's uh, you know before the, the missionary came. Mm -hmm. Naskin says traditionally elders were the ones to prevent, monitor, and intervene in family violence. Back then, they're the one that used to keep the peace and, and find ways to deal with with any violence or any anything that's not right. They're the one that make the decision. But Which brings the group to discuss how to put elders back in charge. And we have to find a way to put the elders back in that place where they belong. A lot of their own responsibility were, were taken over by well, social services or whatever, right? Uh, running the family program, the family, and you know, to work with the family. That role has been taken away from them, and so they feel powerless. On power and love for all. Harriet Paul is a participant in the discussions. She's putting what she learns here into good use sharing information about family violence and elder abuse through her radio show on the local station. That's what they call Clinton way of life. So taking it back as well because the, now um, there was a couple of uh, counselors, they've been there for so long. So it's like they just know what to do, what to say, how to help people. And we need people like that. The Klinkchow Friendship Center plans to bring the knowledge shared by discussion groups like this to the Klinkchow government. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Bechacon. It's time for one final break, but still to come. Two men in the Yukon have carved a snow sculpture with a First Nations piece of artwork being the inspiration. It just to show people out there that you could persevere no matter what comes your way.
Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Thanks to Gail that sent us this wonderful picture. This is her view as she takes her daily walk along the river in Fort Francis, Ontario. That's a beautiful photo, Gail. Thanks for sharing. Be sure to send us your great photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. And now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. We start over in the east, plus two in snow in Charlottetown and zero in Fredericton. Minus 16 in Nain and minus 15 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Minus two in snow in Quebec City and minus two in snow in Val d'Or. Minus four in snowing in North Bay and minus three in Sarnia. Minus six in snow in Big Trout Lake and a minus three in Wawa. More snow and minus 12 in Churchill and snowing in minus three in Norway House. Snow and minus two in Barron's River and plus two in Winnipeg. Plus two in Swift Current and plus one in North Battleford. Snowing in minus 19 in Stony Rapids and plus three in snow in Buffalo Narrows. Moving over to the west, a minus eight in snow in Fort Chippewan and plus four in Grand Prairie. Four degrees in Edmonton and plus 10 in Lethbridge. Eight degrees in Victoria and plus five in Quesnel. Plus six, plus six in Dees Lake and plus seven in Smithers. Minus 30 in snow in Old Crow and minus six in snow in Mayo. Minus 29 in Norman Wells and minus 24 in Yellowknife. Minus 32 in Tuktoyuk Tuk and minus 32 in Fort McPherson. Minus 35 and clear in Cambridge Bay and minus 34 in Whale Cove. Minus 36 in Resolute and minus 19 in Iqaluit. An art center in the Yukon has commissioned a one-of-a-kind snow sculpture for an exhibit. And while it may not be obvious at first glance, a meaningful piece of First Nations artwork is the inspiration behind it. Here's Sarah Connors with that story. It takes a lot of snow, chiseling, and shoveling to transform a 10-foot tall block of snow into a work of art. For the last few days, these snow carvers have been shaping snow into an eye-catching sculpture, a kraken's tentacles intertwined with a float plane. And there's First Nations meaning behind this piece. It represents uh, when we're taken and brought back by a float plane. The sculpture was originally based on this float plane carving by Casca artist Dennis Shorty, which is on display at the Yukon Arts Centre. As a child, Shorty was flown by float plane from his community of Ross River to residential school in Lower Post in Northern BC. I put numbers on it in letters. I put LP for Low Post and 282, that's, that's my name, residential school. Yeah. So that's, that's what they're carving. It. Shorty says he struggled for many years with the trauma of residential school and his mother being murdered. He says the piece is a representation of struggle and perseverance. It's just to show people out there that you could persevere no matter what comes your way. The snow sculpture was commissioned by the Yukon Art Center and Whitehorse as part of the Yukon Permanent Art Collection's Collective Memory Exhibit. Sculptor Michel Geniac was intrigued by the piece and chose it from the gallery to recreate, but he wanted to do something different. That was kind of the initial, like, that would be so cool to do a float plane, and then how we can tie it in so that, you know, because it's really hard to do, like, flying planes. Uh, <laughs> so how, it could, how you can make a little bit of a story with the float plane. Geniac says it's up to the viewer to interpret the message. I guess it's just to create more story, kind of more for people to read into. Teslin Clinkett artist Ken Anderson is assisting with the sculpture. He says hopefully it will inspire people viewing the exhibit to learn more about First Nations history. You know, obviously that school down in Lower Post is gone now, but um, it's kind of about the memory, right? I mean, kind of like this piece, it'll be gone 
it won't last too long but it's it's like that but it, but it was still here you know so the memories are still there right i would like to see it we know those two too so shorty says he plans on traveling to whitehorse to see the sculpture next week sarah connor's aptn national news whitehorse well that's wonderful work being done there in the yukon all right that's all we have for you tonight on aptn national news I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.